I am really excited to be able to introduce our for our keynote speaker. Um, many of you know that, you know, as I said earlier, COVID has had a huge impact this year. Um, one of the things that I think uh, has frustrated some people has been a, a government response and the government response to COVID, especially early. But one of the real standouts of the government response, especially in the United States and then extending elsewhere, has been the COVID 3D trust. And the real leader of that is our speaker, uh, Megan McCarthy. Megan was instrumental in building a platform that allowed the government and the open source hardware community that were coming together to build out PPE and other equipment to move it out into the world and make it go forward. And this is no small feat because in addition to juggling COVID, Megan was also trying to, to, go, to interact with an entire open source hardware community and an entire US federal government to all make it happen. And so there, there's no better person to be the keynote speaker to kick us off uh, at the 2021 Open Hardware Summit than Megan McCarthy. Megan, it's all you. All right, hey everyone. Michael, that was um, uh, a really nice introduction. So I hope um, <laughs> the expectations aren't too high here. Um, let me just see, I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go. And uh, great, perfect. Um, so anyway, thank you guys so much um, for, for having me on. I'm really, really excited. Speaking to the open hardware community, is is really Im important to us especially over the last year so um and i'm going to try and run through this a lot but i want this to be the start of an of an ongoing dialogue um you know moving into the future to see how we can extend what we've done and and better support this i'm going to give my little disclaimer at the beginning nothing i say here um uh is on behalf of the the federal government so we just put that in there but i'm going to be talking about our, our um you know government work and through our public pirate partnership so uh a quick background um i went i am with the national institute of allergy and infectious diseases under the national institutes of health um some of you may be familiar with our director um uh dr tony fauci um and uh that on the bottom right is the nih director francis collins um and he is holding a 3d printed model of the sars cov2 virus that that we developed um at, at naaid based on electron microscopy data and um We've been 3D printing since 2007, and we use these models to help our, our researchers and staff communicate these kind of things. So he was actually bringing that out um, at, um, at a congressional briefing back towards the beginning. Um, our program also works with um, virtual and augmented reality. So we, I'm going to be talking really about 3D printing today. But um, you know, the program essentially embraces this whole spectrum of 3D technology from the 3D printing, this physical um, physical objects into the augmented and, and virtual reality and those um, immersive experiences. Um, so our sort of this, this uh, our, uh, I'll call it maybe a, a flagship um, from, from our team. We're in the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and Computational Biology at, at uh, NIAID. In 2014, we launched the NIH 3D Print Exchange, which is uh, an open portal where anyone can upload to, to share 3D printable models related to bioscience and, and medicine. And that includes medical models and uh, molecular, uh, molecular uh, visualization models and um, uh, open hardware. So we are actually working on version two, and I can tell a little bit about that later, but we're expanding to be, go beyond 3D printing into encouraging use of these digital 3D assets into virtual and augmented reality and, and web-based 3D visualizations. But I will back up to the, the last year, which um, what even is that, uh, you know, where, where are we now? Um, uh, is that, you know, COVID, COVID came about and it and it really happened quickly. We all know that. Um, and uh, on on you know it was March 11th that the World Health Organization declared this outbreak a global pandemic. The U.S. went from from that day the U.S. went from 
245 cases per day to over 30,000 cases within one month. Um, and there was this really desperate need for PPE really quickly. Um, and, and why did that happen? There's lots of reasons we can go into, you know, global supply chains and, um, these kind of vulnerabilities, the, the fact that this was not, um, anticipated, um, you know, how can we be, be better prepared for that? Um, you know, the, the WHO declared this pandemic on March 11th. There were, um, you, you know, the, the open design and, and open hardware and, and making community, really stepped up in, in an incredible way. The, the open source medical supplies group um, that um, Gui Cavalcanti founded on Facebook, that was March 9th. So this was, this was really quick. I mean, it was even before it was declared um, a, a pandemic. And I'll just go back, here we go. Uh, and it was a global response. So you had people designing and sharing from all over the world. And what we had there is that this supply chain crisis, this response, there was enthusiasm, there was generosity, it was open source, people were sharing, the 3D printing technology itself is, is democratized, it's you know, relatively affordable and accessible, it's available across the globe. 3D printing and additive manufacturing technologies themselves are agile in that, that they, um, you know, instead of things that are injection molded and you have to retool your entire production pipeline, you know, you can just go and, and maybe your whatever widget you were making before, you can just make a, something 3D printed. You don't need to, you don't have that that lag time. And we know there was this really urgent need. Um, but the, the other side to that is that we had less experienced producers coming into this space. All of this was absolutely necessary, but a lot of these designs didn't have really, um, what we saw is enough documentation and instructions. So it's not enough to just share your 3D printable file for PPE. There has to be more along with it. There's also this, this gray area in standards, um, which is uh, un unfortunate, but. It, it just wasn't, you know, the need for PPE like this. And then not even that, but, um, you know, kind of the, the average everyday person and smaller manufacturers jumping in to fill that, you know, there just, there wasn't guidance out there. Uh, and that was an issue. There was also liability concerns from open source when you had um, manufacturers that, that did have the capabilities to scale up. They were, you know, hesitant to start printing PPE again because of that lack of standards, lack of documentation and instructions, and and what was that going to mean for them? But you know, that this was a, a desperate time, and and there were, um, this was the the sort of what we were seeing is that there was a lot out there, but there's really high stakes when you are designing PPE to protect people against a really highly highly infectious pathogen. So there were real safety concerns to this. And um, what we did is, uh, that, so our group at the, the NIH, we partnered with the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, uh, their, their group in additive manufacturing, the Veterans Healthcare Administration, they have a whole network for um, 3D printing and innovation across their hospital network. And then America Makes, which was our, our public-private partner, to help us uh, engage with industry and help scale up some of this production. So what I want to point out is if you're not familiar with how the U.S. government works, um, and things don't necessarily happen that quickly, um, but we were really proud of the fact that, you know, we, we got on this right away. We had um, uh, an MOU among our groups published within 10 days of, of, of getting that first draft. And I, I think that the theme here that I'm going to go into is really about trust. So um, that, that was one aspect is that we had all had all of our, our representatives from, from our organizations had uh, established relationships. We saw stuff happening. We were texting back and forth and going, okay, well, what can we do to support this? And the, the NIH, our team, based on the fact that we had this existing infrastructure to help support, um, to help gather these designs and um, essentially, I guess, filter the noise 
from all of the hundreds, even upwards in the thousands of designs that were being shared across the web to kind of get those and then and and test them. So initially this it all happened really quickly. It was our COVID-19 supply chain response collection. And we said, we know we need a better name for it. So <laughs> eight months in, we renamed it to COVID 3D Trust, a trusted repository for users and suppliers through testing. And that was received really well. I was really excited about that. These are the, the stats for how much our, our um, site activity increased. And um, I guess a day after we we announced the MOU um, and, and Dorothy Jones from, from Nation of Makers, she made this announcement on Facebook and it actually like broke our site. <laughs> there was so much activity. So that was great. And people were ready for this. So we had almost 500 designs uploaded within the first month it was really incredible um and at the same time you know i was seeing this incredible response from the community but then we're getting emails from people that were really desperate for ppe and um our, our group our, our partnership was not in a position to to supply that other than um america makes work in connecting people in need through they they developed an online portal that that um they developed an online portable portal using our API to connect people um, and organizations in need of PPE with manufacturers that were able to, to provide that. So um, th this was a, a group effort, but I, I really want to highlight what the, the DHA did because they printed everything out and there was, I, I you know, We've got over 600 published designs on there now, and there was just a flood of, of uploads. And, you know, the key to this was actually trying to assess designs and see what we could in this, in this um, theme of trust. How could we help people, um, you know, make better decisions when they were looking at uh, different designs and materials and things like that? They went through, and and you can see here some of the the testing that they did. Um, you know, with the, masks were difficult because you have you know solid three D printed material. How do you get that to conform to your face? Um, you know, face shields. We know there was many different designs, and how do you optimize that so you're not going to be exposed to any kind of aerosols coming in from above, um, uh, uh, droplets, things like that. Um, so, so what we did is, you know, there was this absence of, of standards and I want to, I want to emphasize that things were not, we, we can't say that things were capital T tested or capital V validated, um, because that, that doesn't necessarily exist. So what we were trying to do is just sort of put a label on things that would increase that level of trust. So the things that were tested, they, the, the VA's team, um, you know, they're engineers working with clinicians at the Seattle Veterans Administration Hospital and working with the University of Washington. So seeing, all right, this looks good. We've tested this, you know, you could, this is safe to use in a clinical setting. And then things that were more for community use, like, you know, this is great. Go and use this for personal use get it to your um, essential workers in your community and grocery stores, schools, um, uh, you know, detention centers, things like that. And then things that, um, you know, were just not fully optimized, we put a prototype label on. And then there's some content like um, ventilator splitters that we, we wanted to leave things like that up. And, and um, you know, allow people to continue to, to innovate on those and, and experiment. But we also wanted to, people to know, hey, be really careful this because there are safety risks. So a lot of this focus was on documentation. So the VA actually had to kind of develop their own checklist of, of tests. And, um, you know, people need to, again, it's not just about that file. You have to have additional information there, not just information for the, the, the manufacturer, but for people to use it and that the manufacturers, you know, whether it's large scale or small scale or, or an individual to, to provide that to, um, to the end user. So there were a lot of really good examples of, of people donating their time and supplies to you know, create hundreds of face shields for a hospital, but without 
enough information, hospitals, you know, unfortunately there are stories that they ended up in a dumpster because they just, you know, it was outside of their uh, normal procurement, uh, procurement uh, um, avenues and how, what is that level of trust there? Again, I'm gonna say that word o over and over again. Um, but so we ended up with, as I said, hundreds of designs. They are, are curated. You can you can filter and see, you know, to to kind of find what you're what you're going to use. From March until the end of September, we had um, almost two hundred and ten thousand downloads. So that was really really exciting for us. Um, and again, with that that trust, as I mentioned, our organizations had um, uh, you know had built up relationships over time. So so that was really critical to having well-defined roles. You know, there was no no one competing with each other. It, it was just a really, really great partnership of, of us all working together. It's something that none of our organizations could have done on our own. So um, based on all, all of that, um, you know, it, it, was, it was really great to see that those labels that were applied, um, you know, helped people be more comfortable using, uh, accepting supplies and, and making them. So we got a really good response from that. Um, and um, I've taken here from the uh, impact report from the open source medical supplies and nation of makers that was published on, on January 18th, that they went out and gathered all of this information. And it's just, it's just a really incredible outpouring of, of support from all across the globe. So I will not, there was a lot of lessons learned. I won't um, dwell on that. These are the same references that, that, that Michael um, had put up at the beginning. I really encourage everyone to go and read those reports. There's really a lot of work that needs to be done forward, especially um, in the case of policy. And as we're thinking about what government can do to support this and use 3D printing and additive manufacturing as a way to fill the gaps um, in supply chain in uh, in an emergency while the um, manufacturers, say with injection molding capabilities, uh, get retool their facilities and, and then can really scale it up. So um, again, that, that impact report was really kind in, in recognizing this, you know, they're saying an IH3D print exchange, but it's the whole effort, um, a model for government facilitation of open source design sharing. And we've always been focused on open source with the, the, the code that we use, um, uh, helping, you know, with, with licensing and, and helping facilitate that open source sharing. So even down to the applications that, that uh, the 3D modeling applications that run some of the workflows on the back end of our scripts and all of our code is, is published on GitHub. So that's really important to us. But what I want to talk about in this theme of trust is what does responsible design look like? So you need to have a multidisciplinary team. So for example, the, the VA had engineers and clinicians um, working, uh, working together to test this out. We had the FDA informing standards um, and development. We had, we had a number of different uh, government organizations that, that were coming in and informing things because there were so many different um, gaps that, that we almost you know, didn't realize were there that, that we had to fill. The other is to, to think about risk assessment. And, you know, this was a really crazy time. Uh, people were dying and, and um, frontline healthcare workers did not have what they needed. And in that, in, you know, in that kind of fast moving situation, you really have to jump in and, and get people what they need. But when we think about responsible design and, and, and moving forward, is to really, um, you know, think about what is the risk in in designing this. What do I need to, um, what do I need to account for? What's important for testing? And I really can't emphasize that enough. That the testing and um, thinking about uh, documentation is really critical. And then, you know, some of these standards we're missing. But can we go out and and make those available? Um, a designer should be aware of those and thinking about that and keeping that in mind and trying to meet those because it then does help 
larger scale manufacturers be more comfortable doing that and in, and in turn the end users accepting it. Being conscious of materials was something that was, um, uh, it, and it remains difficult to, to nail down what is safe when you, it, it's one thing to be using um, different, you know, thermoplastic filaments that are going to touch your skin. So like PLA or ABS on a face shield that's going to be on your forehead. But it's different when you have uh, a 3D printed face mask that is going to be sitting on, on your face for several hours. If there's humidity. Are there issues with off-gassing from the plastic? NASA was really helpful in, in going out to their databases and, and helping with that. And that, that's still something that, that needs to be fully answered. And then also this idea of IP, this is Michael's area. Um, I typically have him on, on speed dial to say, you know, can, I, should, I should really have you on retainer, Michael. Um, but uh, that, that, to, that we can look at these, there's a lot of different stories and, and Michael has, has written on them. Um, you, you know, with open source, we want people to get out there and share. We want to protect people's designs, but also be knowledgeable. I know there are designs that haven't been published and shared because people are thinking about patenting it. And yes, it's a usable object, but, you know, does it bring novelty? Is there something to patent? You really need to be informed on that so that you're not holding back the designs um, that, that the designs that other people can benefit from when the maybe when that that patentability isn't there and then also thinking about how much you are actually are actually really willing to enforce that um and that's something that i've learned over time again thank you michael um is that the those um ip labels whether it's it's, it's copyright you know if you're going to say non-commercial use or for for patenting it's only worth it if you're going to protect it uh if you're going to enforce it um, so we, we also really want to think about how do you make, coming from the scientific realm, we think about fair data. That means it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I've been on a campaign for, for many years, and I won't bore everyone here, about the, um, the lack of, of good standards in 3D data and file formats. But we really need to, to think about that. And I think this is one of the lessons that we learned from COVID is you have this file that you're going to share. I, I send you, hey, here's this face mask. And then it, can we put the, the versioning and proven, provenance information into that? Can you embed the instructions and materials? How can, how can we facilitate that? Are there ways that we can think about, you know, I don't wanna go into digital rights management, but can you put some kind of a signature on something so that someone ensures that they're getting something, something verified? And maybe that's something like embedding metadata um, with the open hardware certification. Um, so we are moving forward with this. This effort is not stopping. We want to continue um, helping to, to support this effort, and this is COVID, there's more emergencies going to come, whether it's a pandemic or not. Uh, so, so we were continuing to work with America Meeks with this, um, you know, taking, they're building out a, a portal that will connect to ours. Um, the VA is continuing to test, again, working with us and America Meeks. The um, many groups from the Department of Defense, especially the, the Army and the Navy, are, are developing uh, PPE and other devices. They're supporting the testing efforts. So it really needs to be an ongoing thing so that we are ready for the future. So we, I, you know, my message to all of you in the open hardware community is to continue to innovate, to share your designs, to test them, again, documentation, but that we can engage throughout this process. And it isn't this you know, everyone scrambling. We want to be able to do that. And, and our platform, we want to help support that. And um, coming next year is the the um, new version of our site, NIH3D. So um, we're rebuilding it completely from the ground up. It's going to be more interactive. We're going to support um, more uh, 3D file types. All of these lessons learned over the last year, we're incorporating, putting in that open source hardware, certification. And, and as I said, I really want this to be the start of a dialogue and going out, um, becoming, coming back to the open hardware community to um, you know, gather your feedback. How can we support this? 
keeping an eye on what sort of um, uh, policy improvements are there and thinking about what can the government do. At the beginning, I had a lot of conversations with um, people in the open source and, and making community, uh, the maker community saying, we're not the bad guy coming in. You know, we really want to help. You know, people have, um, you know, uh, criticisms of, of government historically that the government can be slow and the government, you know, isn't good at innovating and government can slow things down. And, and I'm really proud of what we've done that it, um, you know, that we can support that and, and be a good example and, and hopefully uh, encourage future projects in, in that sense. So um, this is just a, a quick, there are so many organizations that, that supported us. Um, and actually, like I, I have left off the, the Wilson Center and, and NYU um, Engelberg Law Center. I, I do want to thank you guys because you have done work in, um, in, in engaging the, um, uh, the groups that have responded in this way. Um, and you, gathering this information, putting it out there. Um, and I know that was a lot of work and I, I really appreciate that and appreciate you guys, um, including my group and, and others in the conversation. Um, so this was sort of our, our core team from FDA, VA, America Makes and NIH um, that we were meeting seven days a week, um, every, every day for three months and then um, uh, five days a week, and, and now we're down to, to three days a week. So this is continuing. It was a really, um, it was a really big effort. <laughs> um, and and then I'll just give a, a last sort of shameless plug for some more of our resources. If you're interested in in, in looking at models of the SARS-CoV-2 virus or or those related molecular structures, you can go to our website. And I would encourage you to go and download our Pathogen AR app. And you can look at some of those structures as well as um, do your own um, COVID nasal swab test in augmented reality. So um, please check that out. Again, thank you so much. Um, please reach out to us and we'll be continuing to, to reach out to the community to, to engage moving forward. But um, I'm very excited to be here and thank you all for listening.